Hello everyone, Mr. Minix, my name, math is my game, and today on this um, bright, shiny day, um, we got new lights in the room, it's kind of dim in here, but that doesn't affect this playback. Anyway, I'd like to give a shout out to my first period class, they're going to um, assist me in this endeavor, they're real excited to be here. Um, we, we were going to have a chapter test today, but I thought it would be prudent at this juncture to review polynomials. So, um, here we go. First of all, with polynomials, the definition. This was a long time ago in a land far away. We defined the polynomial. We said for all real numbers, for all real numbers. Um, I think we started with, uh, for all real numbers, a sub i, um, and natural numbers, and natural numbers, and natural numbers, and a polynomial is defined in the following way. A polynomial, a polynomial, is defined as follows. And I'm not even going to use a polynomial function, just a polynomial expression. Keep in mind, if I put p of x, that would be a polynomial function. But we say that it's something like a sub, um, a sub n uh, x to the n, I think, right? And then plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1, and then plus a sub n minus 2, x to the n minus 2, and then plus, da 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 plus a sub 2, x squared, plus a sub 1, x, plus that one um, person from that one game, Virtual Fighter, I think it is, a sub 0. So that was how we defined a polynomial. Now, I, I keep in mind, if we put a p of x in front of it, p of x equals, then it's a polynomial function. But this expression here, um, in its glory, the whole thing, is a polynomial expression. Okay? And we said something about this, this whole thing. That has a name. Anybody remember what its name was? It's not the second one. It's not the third one. It's not the last one. It's the, the first term. The first term. And in that first term, um, each part of it tells us a lot about the polynomial. A sub n actually has a name. If it were a dancer, it would be the male partner because it is the leading, the leading, looking for a C word here, coefficient, good. The leading coefficient. And that actually tells us something about the shape of the graph. Anybody recall? What would happen if the leading coefficient is positive? The graph's going to be going up on the right. Good. Um, so then we talked about this exponent. What's that thing called? The degree. Yeah, n is the degree. Keep in mind or notice one thing that's going on with all these exponents. It, the exponent starts out with n, which is some natural number like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc. So it's supposed to be a natural number according to the definition. And then the next time we write a term, it's a natural number smaller than the one before. And then the next time we write a term, it's a natural number smaller than the one before. So, so the, the first term, what's so important about it is it is supposed to have the largest exponent. Okay. Um, so there's that. And then the other terms in the middle, do they matter? Yeah, they matter. Um, but they're not as important as one other term in this. Anybody know what other term is real important in this? The a sub 0, yeah. The a sub 0 uh, has a couple different names we could call it. Another C word that ends in a T. Constant, good. It's the constant. And um, there's something about the constant that we, there's two things about the constant that we really ought to remember. One of them is it's going to be the uh, hyphenated word. Not y-coordinate, but the y. 
intercept. Good. It's going to be the y intercept of the graph. So the graph will go through the point 0, comma a sub 0. And then uh, there's one other thing that the constant does. Maybe we'll come back to that. All right. So that's how we defined a polynomial. And then we got into nomenclature. Norm Norman Clotcher was a, was a good man. <laughs> so let's just look at a couple of polynomials, shall we? Something like y equals x plus 8. That polynomial has how many terms in it? Two. Because it has two terms, we would call it a binomial. Good. So a polynomial with two terms is called a binomial. Because the degree, because the largest exponent is 1, and because when we graph this thing, it's going to look like something we learned in Algebra 1, um, and in Chapter 2 or 3, it's, it's linear, I heard somebody say. Good. So this is called a linear binomial. Okay. Let's look at something like this. P of x is 2 minus 5x plus 7. If we looked at something like that, I think some people might inadvertently or accidentally misname that. They might look at the first term and say, well, the first term doesn't have an x. So the first term is 2 times x to the 0 power, and they might say, well, the degree is 0. Well, the degree is not 0. Keep in mind, whenever you name one of these things, you should put it in standard form first. Anybody think they know what this is going to be? P of x equals negative 5x plus 9. So naming this based on its degree and how many terms it has, what's this one? This is also a linear binomial. Okay. At first, we might have been inclined to think, well, it's a trinomial because there's three terms. Well, the deal is you got to put the thing in standard form first, right? Standard form terms written in descending order by degree. Let's look at two more. Um, f of x equals 6x squared minus 5x squared. What about that one? What would we call that thing? Joe? Jane? I'm here in a quadratic polynomial. That's kind of right. So, so I'm here in a, poly, a quadratic polynomial. When we combine like terms, we're going to get x squared, right? So it is quadratic. It is quadratic. Now, how many terms does that thing have? Just one. So we call it a quadratic monomial. Yeah, quadratic monomial. So if there's one term, it's a monomial. If there's two terms, it's a binomial. If it's three terms, it's a trinomial. And if it's more than three terms, it's a polynomial. And then I said there was one on the midterm exam that kind of went something like this. I think it was just, uh, you know, name the, name the cubic polynomial. That one is cubic. That one happens to be a binomial, but it could be called a polynomial, too. Was it just x cubed on the quiz, on the midterm? Okay. But this one is cubic. This one having two terms would be a cubic binomial. If it was just like that, it would be a cubic monomial. Nonetheless, it still is a polynomial, regardless of how many terms it has. Okay, so, so don't, when we talk about the word polynomial, I guess to make things clear, polynomial, just because the root word, or the prefix there, rather, just because a prefix says many, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, or has to have many terms. Okay, all right, so that was chapter 5, section 1, for the most part, and then we looked at end behavior. We said that when a, a polynomial is graphed, on the ends of its graph, it's going to do one of four things. And that's a little bit different than what's going to happen when we look at graphs from Chapter 8. When we graph things from Chapter 8, we're going to see stuff that looks like it should belong in health class.
or maybe biology. That's another another day, another lesson. So what kind of end behavior is were there? What four conditions? Down, up. Up, down. Up, up. And down, down. So or a few minutes ago we said um, the graph's going to be going up on the right when? The graph's going to be going up on the right when? When the leading coefficient is positive. Whenever the leading coefficient is positive, the graph's going to be going up on the right. So what about when the graph goes down on the right? What do we know about the leading coefficient? It's negative. The leading coefficient is negative when the graph's going down on the right. All right. Now, what do we know about the degree of a function that does the opposite things on the ends? The degree is ODD odd. So the degree, the degree is odd. The degree is odd when the function does the opposite things on the ends, like that and that. And what do we know about the degree in the other cases? The degree is even then. The degree, the degree is even in those instances. I can't even. <laughs> so let's go back for a minute and, and look at those polynomials that we named a minute ago. If we could find them. There they are. What about y equals x plus 8? What's the end behavior of that going to be? Leading coefficient's positive. I'm hearing up, down. It's not up, down. If we're looking at y equals x plus 8, it's not up, down. But it is going to do the opposite things on the ends. It's down, up. It's down, up. Let's go to p of x equals negative 5x plus 9. What's the end behavior there? That one's up, down. Let's look at f of x equals x squared. What's the end behavior of that one? Up and up. And then g of x equals x cubed. The end behavior of that one? down and up. How are we feeling about the end behavior? All right. Okay. That was chapter 5, section 1, maybe 2 also. So the next thing we looked at then is operations. Adding, subtracting, and multiplying polynomials. Adding, subtracting, and multiplying polynomials. So in the context of a story problem, most textbooks love to, to give you something like this. There's this rectangle or some yard if you would and the length of the yard is four feet longer than the width and they might ask you okay what's the perimeter you know the first thing most people are going to do they're going to multiply the length times the width <laughs> is that the perimeter no uh, that would be the area good so the perimeter what's the formula only for the perimeter of a rectangle It's, a, it's, it's what M&M &M said. There's two trailer park girls go round the outside, round the outside. <laughs> so it's the distance around the outside. So what do we got to do? Add up all the sides or double the sides and, and yeah, something like that. So it could be twice the length, or twice the width plus twice the, um, the length, right? Is that the formula for that? Okay. So that would be uh, 2x plus 2x plus 8, or in this particular instance, 4x plus 8. How's everybody feeling about that? All right. So if you did have to find the area, if you did have to find the area, then that would be x times x plus 4, or x squared plus 4x. All right. How are we feeling? Copacetic. Well, there's that third dimension sometimes that happens. There's that third dimension that sometimes happens. So it, it's the, the obligatory box problem. They're saying, we got this piece of cardboard, and we want to make a box out of it. And we're not going to tell you any of the dimensions. We're just going to say that... Um, that the width, 
but actually they're going to tell you this. <laughs> they, might, they might tell you this. They might tell you um, the, the length of this. They say this piece of cardboard is 18 inches this way. This piece of cardboard is 6 inches this way. And we're going to cut an unknown chunk out of it. We don't know how wide that chunk is, but it's, 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 we're going to cut that out of it in a, a square on each corner. So if you picture that piece of cardboard, if we were to kind of flip that thing up on end, you know, we'd end up having a flap like this, right? Everybody kind of see what's going on there? So the height of that flap is X. So it's going to end up making a, it's going to end up making a box, right? So this is the, the, the box problem that they always like to give you. Sorry, my, my artist skills aren't, aren't so hot today. Um, but, so we're going to be making some kind of box here, right? And we want to be able to maximize the volume of that box. You want to see how this problem goes? Now we need to write a formula only for the volume of the box. They won't give this to you. Volume of the box, what's it going to be? Uh, it's not going to be 18x. Volume is comprised of three dimensions. The length, the width, and the depth. Yes? So how long is this box? Oh, it's not 18. Minus 2x, yes. Yes, the length is 18 minus 2x. And what about the width of the box? 6 minus 2x. And what about the height of the box? X. So right here is an algebraic expression that could be plugged into some kind of graphic utility and analyzed so that we can calculate the maximum volume of the box. So on my trusty calculator, I'm about to look at a graph, and I'll graph that function. I don't even have to put it in standard form. That's the beauty of this. 18 take away 2x times 6 take away 2x times x. So I really don't see much of the graph. So what kind of zooming utility should I do? Zoom fit menu. Zoom fit. All right. Now, keep in mind what X represents. X represents how tall that flap is. Some questions say, what's a reasonable domain? Domain's all the possible X values. Is it reasonable to talk about a flap having a negative height? No. So what I'm getting at is it's probably not even necessary to look at the um, anything to the left of the y-axis. Does that make sense? So we're trying to find the, the volume of this box, the maximum volume of this box. So what I want to kind of zoom in on, I don't know if you can see it and how well I can do a highlighting this, but I'm going to try to zoom in. I'm going to try to zoom in right here. Right here. Okay. So that curve represents what the volume of the box is for various widths of the box. Does that make sense? So I'm going to try to calculate that relative local maximum. So when I analyze the graph, I find the maximum. And so I get an x coordinate of 1.35 and a y coordinate of 68. So I get 1.35, 68. Now suppose these units are centimeters and centimeters. Okay. So what does that mean exactly? Anybody want to take a shot at this? This is a math class. We don't have to write or talk. <laughs> uh, in, in interpreting this, that's saying the maximum volume of this box would be how many cubic centimeters? Either 68 or 1.35. No, not 1.35. It's 68. The maximum volume of the box would be 68 cubic centimeters when what? when X or the width or that flap of that box is 1.35 centimeters. Got him? Okay. Cool. That's a real common problem that occurs on these kinds of tests. I don't know if it's going to be on your chapter test, but 
real common problem. So operations, adding polynomials, adding them is real, real simple. Just combine like terms, multiplying them, that's foiling. We don't, I don't think we need to see all that. Um, so then the next big ideas that we talked about were factoring. Oh, man, factoring. Oh, no, we, we saw all kind of factoring techniques for something like this. A squared plus or minus 2AB uh, plus B squared factors into either A plus or A minus B, the quantity squared. We saw that technique. We saw this other one, A squared minus B squared factors into A plus B times A minus B. Oh, we saw this other technique for factoring. If we had something like um, RA plus RB plus, I'm not going to say it, plus SB equals R um, plus S times A plus B, right? Um, and then there was another one, A cubed uh, minus B cubed is a minus b times a squared plus a b uh, plus b squared. And then there was another one, a cubed plus b cubed is a plus b times a squared minus a b plus b squared. And then we factored out GCFs, and we used those in the context of, of solving problems. Solving something like, I don't know, 18, no, not 18, um, let me make that 81, 81x 81 to the fourth, 81x to the fourth um, minus uh, 24x equals zero. Yeah. Yeah. How many answers is that thing going to have? Four. Good. So the directions here would say solve, you know, and they wouldn't tell you solve by factoring, but we probably ought to be able to factor out a, a GCF out of that, huh? I'm here in X. We could do better than that. 3x, good. So we would, could factor out a 3x, which would leave in its, in its place what? 81 divided by 3. Um, the age I wish I was again. 27. Good age. 27x cubed minus what? 8. And that is equal to zero. Do we know any of our answers just yet? Which one? X is zero. Good. This fact right here that 3x is one of our factors means 3x is zero. So we divide by three. So one of our answers, one of our values of x that satisfies that is that x equals zero. Um, oh, how on earth are we going to solve that cubic? We could graph it. We could set the thing equal to. Um, we could put the eight on the other side and take cubed roots, but that's only give us going to give us one more answer. And how many more answers do we need? We need three more answers. So taking the cube roots only going to get us one more answer. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to to factor a difference of two cubes? There is. It would be nice, and there is a way. We're going to have to use and apply this thing. Right? So then we would have um, something like, the, what's the cube root of 27? The cube root of 27. 3. So we'll have 3x. Uh, it's a minus, so it's a minus. And the cube root of 8 is a 2. Uh, and then, so then we'll get this trinomial. So we square 3x. So that's going to be 9x squared. Um, and then we've got to multiply 3x by 2. So that's going to be plus 6x. And then we've got to square the 2, so that's plus 4. So this factor, 3x minus 2 equals 0, tells us 3x is 2 and tells us x is the fraction 2 thirds. 
So we get two answers. We get this one and this one. We're halfway there. Meow. Is that other trinomial going to factor? I said something about those a long time ago, three, four weeks ago when we, when we looked at these. I said whether or not it's going to factor. It almost looks like a perfect square trinomial, doesn't it? But it's not. And it's not going to factor, sorry. If you thought it was going to factor, it's not. So the deal is, with that 9x squared plus 6x plus 4 equals 0, to solve that, we're going to have to go all the way back to chapter 4. x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Right? So then we would get negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 36 minus a lot. 16 times 9, I don't know what that is. Something ends in a 4. 36 times 4. Is that 144? 9 times 4 times 4. Yeah, 144. Okay. That's 144, and that's all over 18. So then I get negative 6 plus or minus the square root of, um, that's going to be 108. Negative 108. That's all over 18. Oh, man. Does 108 have any big perfect squares in it? I guess. Oh, yeah, 36. Um, okay, so that's 36 times 3. So that's negative 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times 36 times 3. That's all over 18. So that would be negative 6 plus or minus Mrs. Accardino. 6i, red 3 all over 18. And the 6 and the 6 and the 18 are all divisible by 6. So I guess that's going to be negative 1 plus or minus i rad 3 all over 3. Wow. <laughs> Another way to write that would be negative 1 third plus or minus um, 0.57i. Where on earth did that come from? Well, I'll show you. Not math way, from inside the, the, the minds of the math overlord. There's a way we could have used the calculator to probably got that answer 10, 10 minutes ago. If, if only I remembered. C poly roots. Oh. Wow. So it was 81x. Oh, man. What am I doing? Parenthesis. 81 x to the fourth minus what? 24 x? Um, and then comma what? x. Ah! Negative 0 0.33333 minus 0 0.57 i. Okay. Negative 0 0.33 plus 0 0.57 i. And then zero and then two thirds. Ah. Oh. Oh, I'm feeling a little bit better about this test being multiple choice and being able to use the calculator. Okay. All right. So nomenclature, operations, factoring, solving equations, oh, dividing polynomials. We're not going to have to know how to divide polynomials, are we? Oh. Uh, uh, Oh, no. Something like 3x to the 4th minus 6x squared plus 7x minus 8. If we divided that by x plus 1, could we use synthetic division? If we divided that same thing by, let's say, x squared plus 1, could we use synthetic division? No. So let's cross our fingers and hope that everything is divisible with synthetic division. 
Um, if suppose we wanted to use synthetic division on that on that first one, what would we put in our little backs? Negative one, good. Maybe the question's going to say, is is x plus one a factor of three x to the fourth minus six x squared plus seven x minus eight? If that's the question, what are we looking for? If the, if they want to know, is this a factor? If they want to know, is x plus one a factor? What are we going to be looking for when we do this process? A zero as the last term or the remainder. Awesome. Good. So let's see. Um, I got to make sure I plug in the right coefficients. I'm hearing a three. I like the three. I hear a negative six. I don't like the negative six. Zero to hold the place of the missing cubic term. Good. And then the negative six. And then the seven. And then the negative eight. I got a volunteer to come on down and, and work through this one. Right on. So here we go. We're going to take that 3 and drop it like it's hot. Multiply diagonally the negative 1 times the 3. That's negative 3. Add down the columns. I like it. Multiply the negative 1 by the negative 3. Add down the columns. Multiply the negative 1 by the negative 3. I like it. Add down the columns. Multiply one more time. And so our remainder is... Um, is negative 18. Nice job. Good. Awesome. Our remainder is negative 18. That's not zero. So is x plus 1 a factor? No. If we had to write our answer, if we just had to, you know, divide that and write our answer, what would our answer? 3x cubed, good. Minus 3x squared. Minus 3x. Plus 10. Not equals 18. And now, remember the remainders, it's got to be what? Plus negative 18 over x plus 1. Good. It is real important that you express the remainder in that way. Okay. Good job. Good. The long division. <laughs> Do we need to look at that again or no? We don't want to, but we can't stop. Okay. The long division, just like we need a placeholders before, we're going to need placeholders again. X squared plus 0x plus 1. I'm trying to see how many times that goes into 3x to the fourth plus no x cubed minus 6x squared plus 7x minus 8. So front end divide, multiply, Subtract, bring down. Front end, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. So when I say front end, divide, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at this, and I want to see how many times x squared goes into 3x to the fourth. It's going to be 3x squared times. So the first term of my quotient is 3x squared. You could write it there or here. It's up to you. Anywhere. Can't write it down here. <laughs> Either here, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and put it over there just to keep my quadratic terms lined up. So where people drop the ball here is they, they forget what they're doing. How did I get 3x squared? I, took, I literally took 3x to the fourth and divided it by x squared. I did a front end division. Yeah. So that's 3xxxx divided by xx. Going to see what cancels out. So um, when I multiply, I need to multiply this by all three of these terms. I'm distributing. So what I'm going to get is a trinomial. I'm going to get 3x to the fourth plus no x cubed uh, plus 3x squared. So this trinomial matches up with the one above it, and I'm subtracting. And you've got to be extra cautious when you subtract here. The, the first terms go away. The next terms go away. I am going to write the plus 0x cubed, though. Um, yeah, well, well uh, what, yeah. So how many x squareds am I going to have? I heard somebody say it earlier. Negative 9x squared. Good. I'm going to have negative 9x squared. And then I bring down that 7x. So I do bring down that 7x. So here's the time now where I do this front end division again. This time I'm front end dividing x squared and 0x cubed. 
How many times does x squared go into 0x cubed? It's going to be 0x. So this is going to be 0x. So again, when I multiply, I'm going to be distributing. I'm going to distribute that to all three of these, and I'm going to get another trinomial. 0x cubed again. 0x squared. And uh, 0x. Now when I subtract, uh, there will be some things that, that are behind. So what do I get? I'm ha I have negative 9x squared, and I'm subtracting nothing. Negative 9x squared, still good. 7x minus nothing, plus 7x, good. And then one more time, bring down that 8. So one more time, another front end division. How many times does x squared go into negative 9x squared? Negative 9 times. And last time I do multiply, I do distribute this to all three of these. So I get negative 9x squared plus no x minus 9, and I subtract. And so the negative 9x squareds, I think those go away. And then I get 7x. And then what? Negative 8 minus minus 9. So that's going to be plus 1. So my answer, so my answer is 3x squared minus 9 plus 7x plus 1 over x squared plus 1. Right. That's a long division. If you didn't get it first time around, there you go. Long division lives up to its namesake. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, let's see. Um, I, st I wrote the factor. I think we kind of talked about the factor theorem. If the, div if the remainder is zero, then the thing was a factor. Oh, finding all the zeros and then all those theorems. So let's look at this one last example I've got up here. Um, cut that and we'll paste it. I did. Well, I cut it and pasted it, I think. Are you serious? Cutting it didn't, didn't do it? I thought, well, let's see. Let's try that one more time. Thank you. I appreciate that. I thought cutting, if you could cut and paste, it would still paste it, but whatever. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what are our possible rational roots here? What could the roots be? One, two, not three, not four, not six, 13. Where would 13 come from? Where are the 1 and the 2 and the 13 coming from? All oh, 26 is factors. That's what else the constant told us. Okay. And, and, and then so there's going to be a 26. Hang out. Plus or minus on all these. Yeah. Plus or minus on all these. Well, if, if this first term had a coefficient of, say, 5, then our list would be longer. Then we'd also have to have plus or minus a fifth plus or minus two-fifths, plus or minus thirteen-fifths, and plus or minus twenty-six-fifths, okay? But it doesn't, so we don't need all that. So, so how many zeros is this thing going to have? Six. So if we had to find all the zeros, we know it's going to have not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six zeros. So what would we do to find them? I wouldn't. The thing, the C poly roots, right? Here we go. C poly roots. Did somebody have that written down, I hope? Nobody wrote that down? X to the sixth minus 5x to the fifth. Oh, it was minus 5x to the fifth, though, right? Okay. Plus 4x to the fourth. Plus 26x to the cubed. 
minus 11x to the squared to the squared minus 3x minus 53x minus 26 so comma x wow, look at that the zeros were negative 1 negative 1 negative 1 2 3 minus 2i and 3 plus 2i wow so negative 1 negative 1 negative 1 2 3 minus 2i and 3 plus 2i. What tells us that this should have happened? The CCT, good. Um, what does this mean if there's a repeated zero? Multiplicity of 3. So the graph, the graph at that particular function, what's the graph of, it, 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 of the function at that point going to look like? Isn't it going to kind of look like a cubic function at that point? Remember all that? Okay. That's it. It's been real. It's been fun. It's been quite the long chapter. I wish everybody the best on the chapter, the best of luck on the chapter test. I'd like to take this minute to give a shout out to the future Mr. Minnick. Great job with putting this together. I'd like to give a shout out to Drew. I'd like to give a shout out to all the people who studied over the weekend. And all the people who don't cry when they take this test tomorrow, have a great day. See you next time. Good.